Hello, I'm Graham Phillips. Welcome to this, the third of our podcast series with the incredible Zoe Harker. If you missed weeks one and two, do go back and watch those first, otherwise this one won't make a great deal of sense. Anyway, in this episode, we discuss what eating real food means and what the benefits are, theory of calories, and how you can change your diet, change your life, and be incredibly healthy in a relatively simple way. Which kind of segues nicely um, into my next question, really. Um, and, and you've covered it, uh, really. So my next question was going to be, we know we're all getting fatter and sicker. What's the root cause and what are the solutions? So you've kind of covered the root causes, but you might want to add something. But now I think let's move on to solutions. Yeah, I mean, in an essence, we're eating the wrong things and we're eating too much of the wrong things. And the other thing about eating too much carbohydrate, because our body is not using it, um, there are also certain attributes of carbohydrates in that, um, you know, we need one teaspoon of glucose in our bloodstream at any one time, one teaspoon, they're so tiny. So you even eat an apple, you've probably just chucked in about 12 grams of glucose, you know, the fructose has gone off to I, the liver. I... I wear a blood, I, I wear a continual blood glucose monitor, right? Quite a lot of the time. The largest sugar spike I've had in the last two weeks, one small green apple. And and as as you know, our dear friend, both of us, David Unwin. Yeah. You know, if you mention the word banana in front no, of I, David. No, I don't Unwin. go near bananas anymore. Yeah. <laughs> You'll just about have a hard it's astonishing. I have also done that. I did that for two weeks. Yeah. I got hold of one of those um absolutely fascinating exercise. Every single person on the planet in the Western world who can afford um, and has access to bad foods um, needs to wear a continuous glucose monitor for two weeks and try out all the different foods during those two weeks. Yeah. And you will never see food in the same way again. So as you say, you know, I'd have a, a, a breakfast. Um, I'm, I'm much more real food than I am low carb. So my breakfast, you know, might well be fruit and um, full fat yogurt and full fat milk. I love dairy, just love dairy. Um, but I did one day not have an orange with my breakfast um, and my blood glucose level stayed pretty fine. You know, a couple of berries and some fatty yogurt and fatty milk, lovely, very nice. Had an orange one day, woo, massive yep. spike. Now mine is is coming down because my metabolic system is still healthy and still working okay. But yep. why did I do that to my body? And the dietitians would then have me an apple mid morning as a snack, cause I've got to have a snack, why? And then I'd have a sandwich at lunchtime and probably a bag of low fat crisps because I deserve it and maybe a fizzy drink. And so it goes on. And so it goes on. And I'm just yeah. doing that all day long. Yeah. Um, and that's just not good. So that, and when you get that, I mean, the body never quite gets it right back onto that four grams perfectly. It does a good job, but it's not great. So let's say it dips just a fractionally below and everybody who's ever tried to diet will understand this. You, you have some chocolate or you have some a biscuit or something about 30 minutes later you want another one why mm. why would that be you've had a biscuit you've had 100 calories you should have that should have been satiating it's the opposite of satiating so your blood glucose level probably ends up slightly lower than it was before you ate the biscuit it so goes up the biscuit. Like, uh, and comes down like a lead balloon exactly. you then have a hypo and you're starving exactly. and you and have the biscuit and yeah. then you have another biscuit and it all goes off again. So I, 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 I yeah. work a lot with people who are trying to lose weight. So we've got a, an online club where we're trying to get people to just eat real food and support each other um, without being obsessive and all the rest of it, being really positive and encouraging. Yeah, you've done really well. Um, that's what we try to do to keep people on track. And they all get that if you start on the pack of biscuits, you can't stop. Yeah. You don't start on the, on the pack of biscuits. That's the easiest thing in the world. Just don't start on it. And then... And then there's no issue. Um, so there's something else about carbs that are they're uniquely addictive. I mean, particularly the refined carbs, the yeah. junk carbs. Um, but a banana will crash your blood glucose just the same. And yet, and when so, you yeah. move more away from carbohydrate to the other two macronutrients, fat and protein, um, you will find those just so much more satiating. Um, and then we'll play with people and say, well, look, why? Try just for a, a, a thing when you're going to work in the morning, getting a full fat latte instead of a skinny latte and notice the difference. And the feedback comes back of, oh, you know, I'm normally hungry for lunch at about 12 o'clock. I wasn't hungry until one o'clock or two o'clock yep. because they start to realize what's going on. So what do you do to lose weight and be healthy? I've, I've got three 
pieces of advice, basically. Number one rule is eat real food. Um, and you get some idiots on the other side going, yeah, what's real food? Um, you know, I can teach a five-year-old. You know, oranges, <laughs> oranges grow on trees. Cartons of orange juice don't. Fish swim in the sea. Fish fingers don't. Um, you know, cows graze in the field. Pepper army sticks don't. You know, how difficult was that? Okay, so eat real food. Number I've got two. this uh, slide that I show. And it's got three things on it. It's got butter, margarine, and some complete fake fat. <laughs> and it's got a, a colony of ants. And all the, all the ants around the butter. And I say, it's weird, isn't it? The ants know what to eat. It's the human beings that don't. Yeah, yeah. And, and we've, it's because we've not been told the right thing. You know, people trust a dietitian or they'll trust a doctor and, and the good doctors admit I was at medical school for seven years and I had half a day of nutrition yeah, half a day is good most of them get literally nothing yeah and, and that's yeah. when you really admire someone when somebody like Asim Malhotra or David Unwin or Jen Unwin or Joe Reynolds you know when those people come out and say I just yeah. wasn't taught this stuff but I'm now I'm here I've caught up I'm ready to learn you know it's really admirable um, so number one, eat real food. Number two, choose that real food for the nutrients it provides. Yeah. Because that then drives you towards meat, especially red, fish, especially oily, eggs, especially yolks, dairy, especially full fat, vegetables, especially non-starchy, <coughs> berries, stuff in season. I'll eat apple. I mean, I, I, I eat apples all year round. If, if you know there's one there, I'll eat it. Um, but we should only really eat them in the autumn because that's when they're indigenous to the to the UK environment. Um, I eat dark chocolate every day. I like it. Um, cocoa powder, whatever. I had brown rice last night because we had a, a dish that went really nicely with brown rice. So I'm, you know, I'm not religious about it, but mm. most of my decisions are I'm choosing. If I have brown rice, I know there's always something more nutritious that I could have eaten. That that's the awareness that I have. Mm. Um, and it's having that awareness because then it it makes you make an, a different choice next time. Yeah. Um, you know, that's the first time I've had rice in, I don't know, months. I just felt like it. So whatever. And then the third rule is eat a maximum of three times a day. So if you don't like breakfast, don't have it. If you don't like yeah. lunch or it's just not convenient for you, then make sure you have a great breakfast and, and a good evening meal. Don't ever get to the point that you're um, you're in such a bad place that your your blood glucose will get so low and you don't have a means of getting it back up to normal um, and, and that happens, by the way, when you're too used to eating carbohydrates. That's what we describe the person that can't do that as the person who's not fat adapted. Yeah, um, yeah during that, um, the preceding two weeks, I had the second two weeks I was playing around. The first two weeks, I did a five day fast wearing the CGM. And I just wanted to see how my and I was exercising and doing everything normally. And, um, and my blood glucose, I never had a hypo. My blood glucose was just flat throughout. I mean, it was literally as boring. It was a flat line. Yeah. And Didn't change is... overnight. And I thought when I, because I do park run on a Saturday, I thought I might see a sugar spike. Very slight, whatever. Um, just shows you, once you're fat adapted, yeah. um, you, and, you know, we've all got a bit of spare fat around us. You can just live on that for a few days. I was hungry about, I had one bad day. I think day two was tough. And by day three, I felt fine at the end of, I was going to do three days, ended up doing five, and I could have carried on. Um, the only reason I stopped was we had a social engagement. No one died. <laughs> There's a couple of really interesting things there. I once yeah. worked out that Paula Radcliffe is carrying about 35 calories of, of fat. Um, and everyone would, and this is when she was marathon running, and people yeah. would say, you know, no way, how can, you know, so to keep the maths really simple, take a hundred pound woman, she probably, yeah. probably wasn't much off that. Yeah. Even when a woman's got a six pack, she's yeah. got about 14, 12 to 14 um, percent body fat. So that's about 12 to 14 pounds. You can use that calorie theory as a rough guide. It's yeah. nowhere more than that. And it still means that if you cut back by that, you will not lose the weight. Don't get confused, but yeah. you can use it as a sort of guide to what kind of fuel you're calorie carrying. Um, and that's Paula Radcliffe. So if she, she's got that amount of fat such that she could run a marathon, then all she needs to be able to do is to be fat adapted so that she doesn't require the carbohydrate fuel. Um, you don't then bonk, as they call it, during a marathon. You don't have that burn or crash or whatever yep. those different words are because exactly. your body just seamlessly flicks from 
carbs to fat or a lot of people won't put any carbs in yeah. my um my brother-in-law runs um i mean he ran he had the record for running the coastline of wales a couple of years ago he runs 1700 kilometers in 26 days on fat fat and protein yeah um exactly. and the second interesting point from what you just said there is when your blood glucose level is flatlining what everyone forgets is that there are two hormones that are keeping your blood glucose regulated one is insulin which is called upon. So the minute you eat the apple, the body goes, whoa, glucose too high, panic, panic. Insulin gets woken up to, to attach itself effectively to the glucose in the bloodstream to take it out yeah. and store it as glycogen. And then conversely, if glucose gets a bit low, as it does with most of us at about four o'clock in the morning, the body will call on the equal and opposite hormone glucagon to put some glucose back into the bloodstream. And it does that by breaking down. Well, it will either go to the glycogen storage room Yep. So if we've got any fuel in there, no. Okay, so I'm going to break down a bit of body fat and just take the glycerol out of the body fat and put that back into the bloodstream. Well, that's weight loss. That's when you're most likely to lose weight. I think this is weight. a really important point that you make here because there's the widely held misunderstanding that you because you, the body needs some glucose, that therefore you have to have carbs. And the point is the body will make the amount of carbs it needs by breaking down the fat <coughs> And fat is stored. People, that everyone hears the word triglyceride, but they don't actually understand what it means. Yeah. And essentially, I I kind of visualise it as a letter E. Mm -hmm. And the prongs of the E are the fat, and the backbone is glycerol. Yeah. And when you break down the fat, the glycerol goes back to the liver. It's remanufactured to glucose. There's the amount of glucose you need. Yeah. And that is why my, you know, even if you don't eat any carbs at all, your blood glucose will not be zero because the body makes the amount it needs from fat and it does for everyone and this this is the yep. astonishing thing you know i remember being with prof noakes down in south africa once and i absolutely remember exactly where we were when he said this we were driving back from a, a function there's actually a bantin restaurant and we were in the car and i can remember the roundabout and he leant over the passenger seat and he said um of course the person who works off uh, who works out how to turn off glucagon is the one who's going to win the nobel prize yeah and Andy and I were sat in the back of the car and it's like, oh, my goodness, that is the secret. If you're trying to maintain blood glucose levels, absolutely being able to control glucagon. Now, there's probably a reason that we can't because that is the body's way of keeping you alive. So my type one diabetic brother, I had to point out to him, your glucagon still works exactly like yep. mine does. Your insulin. You've got ways works. to bring the glucose exactly. up, but no way to bring it down. Exactly. Exactly. So his fear that he was going to go into a hypo in the middle of the night if he didn't sometimes he'd be setting his alarm to have a biscuit at 4 a.m yeah. in the morning yeah like adrian your body is going to do what it needs to do just don't put too much insulin in otherwise you'll disable it from doing what it's doing because they're antagonists exactly so i always think of them as alley cats you know if insulin alley cat is out then glucagon alley cat is not going to be out um yeah and, and one or the other will be out so to enable glucagon to break down body fat, you cannot have insulin presence. I mean, that's the other thing. What is weight loss? Is it a calorie deficit? Oh, where do you start? No. Physiologically, to break down body fat, which is what weight loss is, yeah. you have to not have insulin present, which means you haven't just eaten a carbohydrate. And you yeah. have to not have carbohydrate present, which yeah. also means you haven't just eaten carbohydrate. But it also means you haven't eaten sufficient carbohydrate that it's in your glycogen storage room. Because yeah. the body will keep that for about 24 hours. So you only needed 500 calories. Let's say you ate 1100 calories, body packs a shed load over to the glycogen storage room. And then in the middle of the night, when it's running low in glucose, that's where it will go first, which is why the calorie counters eating lots of carbohydrate don't lose weight because they, how can you ever lose weight if you've always got- You're always refilling your glycogen stores and you're never getting into burning your fat stores. And exactly. then you- lose that fat ad adaptation so when your glycogen store becomes empty you have a massive hypo you feel dreadful and you can't access the fat and, and it's partly because you've got a ton of insulin sitting on it <clears throat> and partly because you start to lose the adaptation to to actually be able to metabolize fat yeah. and you have to get people to go through that transition to get them able to burn fat and then hunger disappears and everything works as it as two million years of evolution designed it to do and that's why you, when you said earlier on, and I forget how you exactly phrased it because you can phrase it in different ways and it can be true. That's why 
you can eat less than you need and still not lose weight. And I think yeah. that's also why you can eat more than you need and still, still not put on weight. weight. Um, now, let's say, I mean, this goes back to the Kequin and Paul Wan study now from 1956 in the Middlesex Hospital. They noticed when they gave their obese patients a diet in, in pretty much, they, they did that macronutrient experiment mm. when they gave it pretty much entirely in the form of fat. They were able to give these bedridden patients 2,600 calories a day and they were not gaining weight. They yep. were actually losing weight in some cases. Mm. And then they flicked that over to predominantly carbohydrate and they were gaining weight at a much lower calorie intake. Um, and th that is so important for people to understand. The other thing we have to have to the point we have to make on the calorie theory is that this whole energy in energy out thing completely negates the idea that the body can adjust in any way. Exactly. Which is the craziest madness at all. So if I don't eat enough over the next week, okay, I might be able to shock my body short term to lose a pound or so really quickly it's going to adapt and say right we're turning off the heating system i'm going to make a cold um you can turn off periods it happens in young girls really really quickly when they start stupid diets the lymphatic drainage is going to slow down i'm going to give a nice puffy um carby looking kind of face kind of thing and it can just go i won't build bone density i won't fight infection i won't do this it just and, it you'll, just and you'll move a lot less as well because that's exactly. another way Exactly. Yeah, your lower body temperature. Yeah. So the, the point is, as you said at the beginning, we're not a closed system. Yeah. And the body's got numerous ways of conserving energy. Of course it has, because the body's adapted to feast and famine. So if you face the body with something that the body believes to be famine, even if it's not, you'll induce all those mechanisms. Yeah. 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 So... Zoe, there's loads more on my list of questions, um, but I'm conscious of time and well, particularly your oh my time. Goodness, um, and what I'd love to do at some point is have you back on and maybe go into some of the more because there's lots of um, little blind alleys I didn't go, uh, didn't get tempted to go down. But um, and particularly talk about heart disease and so on. But I think that's for another day. Um, now you've written several books, um, a couple of which I've read. You're a prolific blogger. Um, and I've, as I said, I've been binging on your podcast for the last few days. For those of my audience who are not familiar with you, where should they start? Um, yeah, just my name, really. So zoeharkham.com. Um, as you say, I do. I, I've been doing this thing, which has become known as the Monday Note. I've been doing it for over 10 years now. So we had the 500th Monday Note. Um, and, and that's my business model, basically. So people can subscribe to that. I think it's a pound a week or something or less if you do it for the whole year. Um, and kind of it's billed as I'll read the studies so that you don't have to. Um, so if something comes out on, um, you know, red meat is going to cause cancer or carbohydrates are going to save your life. Um, I get emails from subscribers and they'll say, oh, can you tackle this one? Um, and, and the topics end up incredibly diverse and, and they need to, because if I'm, I'm working on a Monday note pretty much constantly the whole time, you, you know, you finish one and you start the next. Um, yeah, we did one recently. I, I, I plagiarized it somewhere on my left <laughs> yeah. and this around to the yeah. pharmaceutical journal, which we've blogged about. No, definitely. Yeah. Can, but I, mean, can know, I not... say though, your research, I mean, no, there are not many people that I kind of implicitly trust because I think that's too big a risk. But the quality and depth of your research is so good, I kind of don't need to check. Oh, thank you. I'm, <laughs> I've, I've got a couple of people like that myself as well, actually. Um, I mean, you, this is the next guy you should have on your podcast, um, Dr. It's Malcolm not, Kendrick. Oh, Malcolm, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah th th this is his latest book that's come out. And yeah. Mal Malcolm is one of those for me, actually. Um, no, that's really, really kind thing to say. I mean, just just go to zoeharkham.com. Uh, there are still quite a few on open view. Um, so, you know, I do, I, I do try to put what them on open view, um, the podcasts, uh, my podcasts are on open, um, listen on Spotify and all that kind of thing. Um, loads of videos. I mean, all the public health collaboration videos are on open view. If you put in YouTube, my name, um, the low carb Denver ones and that kind of thing, there's conference in Israel. I mean, just loads yeah. are, are out there. So you don't, you don't have to pay anything. And um pick a topic that you're interested in maybe fiber or maybe dietary fat guidelines and how did we get them and there'll be a, a video out there fantastic zoe um we've covered lots of ground is, is there anything that you'd like to add that we haven't covered 
oh gosh, you know, I asked that question at the end of my podcast as well. <laughs> it, it's um, it goes back to when I when I did my life as um in blue chip organizations, I started off in manufacturing and I ended up as an HR director. So I did loads of um, sort of management level, board level recruitment. And um, that was always my favorite last question in the interview. You know, is there anything that you haven't told me that I haven't given you a, a chance to ask? And um, you did used to get some really good answers, actually. Um, no, I'm really happy. I'm really happy to come back as well, because I think we could get into the um, the dietary guidelines, dietary fat, more saturated fat, why is saturated fat, why it's absurd to think of saturated fat as harmful in any way, um, what's it in, um, nutrition generally, fiber, there's plenty of other places we can go. So we'll, we'll do another one. Fabulous. Well, if, if, you've, if you've got the time and inclination to make a, a, a term visit, we would be absolutely delighted to have you. On it. No and worries. in the meantime, listen, thank you so much. I hope you've enjoyed the conversation as much as I had. I have, and I'm sure our audience will. Absolutely. So um, once again, Zoe, thank you so much. And we hope to see you again. Well, face to face at a future conference. Oh, crikey, wouldn't that be lovely? Thanks so much. <laughs> I've really enjoyed it. Thank All right. You. Take care, Zoe. Okay, I hope you enjoyed the third episode with Zoe and do let us know what you thought of the episode in the comments below. Also, please consider clicking the subscribe button so you don't miss out on future episodes with Zoe and with other wonderful guests.